Okay, so now that we have Aristotle's basic outline of what the virtues are, I want to go through in the next few lectures and talk about the individual virtues he discusses in chapter 3, or book 3 and 4 primarily. You know, he, he mentions some of these already, has some discussions in book 1 and 2, but he really delves into these more deeply in books 3 and 4. And these virtues are courage, moderation, generosity, lavishness, proper pride, good temper, friendliness, honesty, humor slash wit, and justice. And honestly, you know, when we get to the um, case studies, I'm going to ask you guys to justify your responses in terms of particular virtues Aristotle discusses. So honestly, this might not be a bad part of the, uh, you know, lecture to bookmark. Just so you have this list in front of you, it will be helpful, right? I'm going to go down through here. And one thing I'm going to say is, you know, I want to talk about this list of virtues. But, you know, I'm also going to say, well, you know, do we think all of these are virtues? Some of these we might not. I myself am quite skeptical for reasons I'll get to about lavishness as a virtue. Somewhat skeptical about humor slash wit. Not as much as lavishness, but for reasons I'll get to a little bit. And there might be other traits that we think are important in living a flourishing life or morally important to being a good person that aren't on the list, you know, mercy or graciousness or kindness or maybe integrity, right? So I want you guys to think, would you, you know, three questions. A, would you define these virtues in the way Aristotle does? You know, that's the first one. B or the second one, you know, do you think that everything he puts on this list deserves to be here? And then finally, you know, are there virtues or traits that he leaves out? I want you to keep that in mind as we go through here. All right, so the first virtue he discusses, and I'm not going to have a lot to say about this one because we've already used talked about it a lot, using it as an example, is courage. Courage, as we've already said, is a mean between cowardice and rashness. Closer to rashness, the excess, but it is not rashness, right? And so the courageous person feels fear, but he or she feels only the appropriate amount of fear. You know, look, if, if you are facing something that might kill you, it would be stupid not to feel some level of fear. Fear is the perception of danger. To deal with danger intelligently, you're going to have to perceive it as danger, right? If, you know, I were in a burning building and a fireman were coming in to save me, I would not want him to be fearless. I would want him to be properly afraid of, like, beams collapsing on him or not having enough oxygen or any of that stuff, right? That's what Aristotle says is courage. Now, one thing I want to note, you know, Aristotle says, you know, it's generally pleasant to be virtuous. The virtuous life is a pleasant one. And I think he's going to have to qualify this a bit and say, look, being courageous is often not pleasant because it does in a lot of cases involve feeling fear. Only the appropriate level of fear, which is not much fear in most cases. But it might be unpleasant to be courageous. But what Aristotle will say is, well, look, the person who has courage, the person who is courageous, is, for the very reason that he has courage, going to have a more pleasant life than the person who doesn't, right? The person who completely lacks courage is going to be terrified all the time of little things that the courageous person isn't. So the constant fear or the more common fear that people who aren't courageous feel mean that their life will be less pleasant on the whole, Aristotle thinks, than the person who has courage. Now, I don't have a whole lot more to say about courage, and I, I do think it's a very important virtue, but we have talked a lot about it. So, just a few things, you know, one is we might not buy some of Aristotle's own particular claims about courage. Um, his concept of courage is really tied to his own culture, ancient Greek culture that put a lot of emphasis on, you know, courage and warfare, physical courage. 
That seems to be his ideal of the highest courage. Seems not to be as aware of other forms of courage as maybe he should be. And he's dismissive of the idea that people could show courage in sickness. That, that just seems wrong to me, right? I, I do think that being sick and bearing it, you know, is somewhere that people do in fact show courage. I think Aristotle's just wrong about this and his own culture or maybe some other psychological factor just kind of blinded him to that. But look, we don't have to agree with everything Aristotle says. You know, we might not want to define courage in exactly the same way we might not want to say exactly the same things. I'll deal with the virtue of moderation before wrapping up this lecture because we can do it pretty quickly. Moderation is primarily a matter of physical pleasure. It deals with food, drink, sex, maybe in the modern world drugs, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear what Aristotle would say if doing drugs at all could ever show moderation. I don't know. Anyway, moderation is a mean between what he calls feel nothing. You know, some, some, some translations will try to make the term a little less awkward and call it insensibility or something like that. Your translation doesn't. You know, the term's awkward in the Greek, I suppose, so he leaves it awkward, right? It's a mean between feeling nothing and being a glutton or a lecher. Now, it's interesting to note that Aristotle, you know, he puts it closer to the deficiency, feeling nothing, than he does to it being a glutton or a lecher, right? You know, lecher being someone who just can't control their sexual impulses, right? And, you know, he thinks that there's actually nobody or practically nobody in this feel nothing category. I, I, you know, I think he's wrong about that, right? I think there are definitely people who do not enjoy these pleasures to the degree they should. Um, my favorite go-to example is the guy who invented Soylent. Um, there was this computer programmer, Silicon Valley type. Let me look at my notes. I want to spread blame where blame is due. I think this guy's name was something Reinhardt. And... Well, you know, we don't have to blame this poor schmuck. But anyway, this guy invented Soylent because he loved to program, you know, and he got mad about the fact he had to eat. You have to order food for takeout. Of course, this guy never cooked. You have to order food for takeout, then you actually have to eat it. It takes away valuable time you could spend coding. What a waste. What a shame. So terrible, right? So, Rob Reinhardt's the guy's name. So he invents Soylent. Soylent is a shake that you drink that has all your nutrients in it. So now Mr. Reinhardt can not ever have to get up from his chair to take care of unimportant things like nutrition. He can just drink his Soylent, right? I don't, I don't know what he's going to do about going to the bathroom. I don't really want to know, right? <laughs> new, new invention from Rob Reinhardt the adult diaper of the future, right? Anyway, let's, let's not think any more about this guy. My point is, I think Aristotle would say someone like Reinhardt, if you, when you are eating, think to yourself, God, what a waste of time. I wish I could just drink a nasty chocolate shake and never have to like worry about food again. You probably are, in fact, in this feel-nothing category. You have the vice of not enjoying eating as much as you should. So I, I do think there are people in the feel-nothing category. I think Aristotle's wrong about that. Mr. Soylent is probably a good example of that, right? Now, one thing to note, and I think this is interesting, is Aristotle thinks it's more blameworthy to be a glutton or a lecher because there's so many opportunities to practice virtue, to not eat too much, to not let sexual impulses get the better of you, right? Well, that's interesting because it raises the question, are there adequate opportunities to practice all the virtues? And if there are not, then you might wonder whether we're going to be able to habituate ourselves, whether we're really going to be able to develop the virtues in the way Aristotle thinks is necessary. You know, 
take courage. I, I don't know that most of us have enough chance to face physical danger to develop the courage that Aristotle thinks is real courage. So, And if we don't, that might be a problem for virtue theory if we don't have the proper opportunities to develop all the virtues. That is an issue, and it's one I'll come back to. Anyway, I think that is enough about these two virtues. Courage is really important, but we've already said a lot about it. Moderation, there's just not a whole lot to say about it.